Okay, we're live and I see that people are transferring in from the waiting room. So we're gonna go ahead and get started tonight. Um, I just wanna welcome everybody who's joining us tonight for this webinar on laboratory diagnostic evaluation for chronic inflammatory response syndrome um, with Dr. Aaron Hartman. And uh, so Dr. Hartman ha um, is so gracious with his time with us uh, this evening. I wanna introduce him just for a second. So for those of you who are not familiar with who he is, um, you can kind of um, get to know a little bit about him and his background. Um, he is a medical doctor. He's the assistant clinical professor of family medicine at VCU School of Medicine, medical director and principal investigator for Virginia Research Center, um, president of Family Practice Associates of Chesterfield, as well as the founder of Richmond Integrative and Functional Medicine. Um, and if you go to Richmond Inter Integrative and Functional Medicine website, he has some really great blogs um, that you can read to learn a little bit more about chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Um, he's just kind of a, a fountain of information when it comes to this topic. So we're super, super excited and lucky to have him here to speak to us tonight about this. This is such a niche um, topic within the greater field of functional medicine, but also within the field of sort of mold and mycotoxin uh, treatment. So if you do have questions throughout the webinar, feel free to type those into the chat or the Q&A. Um, we're gonna hold all of the questions until the end, so we won't answer them right away, but we will leave some time at the end generally for that Q&A. Um, but for now, Dr. Hartman, thanks for, for being here. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and let you take it away. Great, thank you very much, really appreciate it. I'm really honored that Vibrant Labs reached out to me and asked me to give this talk. Um, this niche of you know, chronic inflammatory response syndrome is something that's actually incredibly common. Um, those of you who are out there practicing functional medicine probably have already seen multiple patients with this condition and you just don't realize it. So um, I'm really excited about this. We need to get the word out there about this and help people. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited about giving this talk. And just a couple of brief um, concepts real quick. You know, This is a superficial overview of labs um, for the diagnostic evaluation. If you wanna take a deep dive, there are places where you can actually get um, uh, fellowship level training. Uh, George Washington University with A4M now actually has a two-part course, Sears Part A and B. Um, it's actually worth over 153 um, AMA um, class one um, CME credits. So it's actually a deep book. There's actually a textbook on CRS now that Dr. Shoemaker, Dr. Heyman and their group put together, which you actually get in that course. So. Um, I'm not gonna to try to do what, what the masters have done. I'm just gonna go over the labs and, and, and put a couple of them, um, things I think that are important for people that are seeing these patients. Um, and then at the end, people can ask questions. So we'll get started. Um, you know, disclosures, you know, the, I think the biggest disclosure is for me is I also am a clinical researcher. So I've done a bunch of studies. I'm actually a part of all the Pfizer um, one, two, three, and four um, COVID vaccine studies right now. I've done over 60 different clinical studies. This is just um, some of the studies. Um, if you care to see some of the research I've been involved with. Um, but these are my, my disclosures on the research side. So, um, so to begin, what is chronic inflammatory response syndrome? It's an innate immune system activation that's elicited by a triggering event. And it's characterized by the following. It's chronic, it's inflammatory, there's some kind of response and it's a syndrome. So the chronicity, it's, it's more than six months. It's not someone who's been sick for two or three months, it's more than six. It's inflammatory, and this is where a lot of the science is changing. It's not a typical, you know, sed rate CRP inflammatory kind of thing. It's actually part of the innate immune system, and it's part where the innate immune system reaches out to, to um, engage the adaptive immune system. So you see things like involvement of Th1, Th2, Th17, the, the coagulation complement pathways. And when we talk about the labs, we'll be talking about these different aspects of the, um, of the immune response. So it is inflammatory, it's response. It's your innate immune system responding to an antigen, but the, the interesting thing, it's responding to an antigen without presentation. And what this means is it's being exposed to some kind of antigen that's not being processed by antigen presenting cell. And what's actually doing is it's activating your innate immune system and you don't get the crossover that you're supposed to get to engage the adaptive immune system and create antibodies. Um, and we'll talk about that in the labs as well. And it's a syndrome. Um, which means we have definable criteria. And this criteria has changed a lot. You know, uh, I'm not gonna say a whole lot about, it. I just wanna go through things briefly, but um, that should be discussed in other, um, in other webinars that I think Vibrant actually put together. But it is a syndrome, so it is definable. So um, I'll go, a couple of things I think I have to talk about just because we're talking about SEERS um, as a diagnosis. There's a two-tier system. You have to have exposure. Now, 
you know, with CRS, 80% of it is water damage building. And I mentioned the ERMI and hurts me too here, but um, there are, you know, Fisteria, Ciguatera, um, recluse spider bites. There are other things that can actually elicit, um, you know, traumatic brain injury, for example, that can as well elicit a chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So you have to have some kind of exposure that you've identified. You know, you have to have this multi-system, multi-symptom illness and the cluster analysis is how you get there. Um, you know, the, the, the criteria for eight or 13 the adults for eight, eight or 13 clusters have to have a symptom for kids six or 13. The biggest thing is ruling out confounding diagnoses, which often are missed. Um, you know, someone can have CRS and other things um, against an innate immune system activation dysregulation. So, you know, a whole host of things can be going on. So you don't want to miss other diagnoses, which um, happens commonly. Um, this is the, the cluster analysis. Um, Hopefully many of you have already seen this. Um, as you look at this, you know, when you think about chronic fatigue, fibro, when you think about mast cell activation syndrome, when you think about you know, um, Asia syndrome, which is autoimmune inflammatory syndrome induced by juvents, you'll see there's probably about an 80% crossover between a lot of these symptoms. And so um, it's kind of interesting um, with a lot of the, the autoinflammatory syndromes I think have interconnected networks to help us treat these patients. The uh, second tier, the actually labs, the main CRS labs for diagnosis. There are other labs we'll talk about as well, but these are the main ones that um, through Dr. Shoemaker and Dr. Um, Heyman's work have actually helped put together like the classification. Um, you have to have genetic susceptibility. There's dysregulation with neuropeptides. There's involvement of the Th1 system, the complement system, part of that innate immune system is dysregulated. And then there's actually brain involvement at the hypothalamic pituitary axis and hypothalamic pituitary um, adrenal axis. And so that in and of itself is kind of interesting how you actually have brain involvement with CRS. These are other labs we're going to talk about. You know, I'll, I'll come back around to the Baton score, which helps with hypermobility of these patients with hypermobility are more prone to CRS. Um, and then we'll kind of come back around to these. And I put an MCAS question mark. Um, I'm in a group with Dr. Afrin. It's really interesting to see the inner, the inner relationship between MCAS and CRS. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is you look at the the, um, the criteria, they're very, very similar. And the other thing is that, um, is that mold is considered a trigger for MCAS. So um, we'll kind of briefly talk about that a little later on. Then there's your really super advanced testing, um, neuroquant transcriptomics, non-specific CRS testing. Um, we'll come back around. We're gonna actually go through these one by one as we actually go through the talk. So this is basically the brief outline um, of what we're gonna talk about. So one quick aside that I like to talk about, you know, what's the difference between chronic inflammatory response syndrome post Lyme, or CRS, water damage building, or PANS and PANDAS, which is actually, the literature shows it's actually a CRS phenomena. Traumatic brain injury, you know, type three Alzheimer's, if those of you who've done Dr. Brenson's training, you know, there's type one, one A, two, three, four, five, you know, type three, you actually do complement screening, C, C4A, um, looking, does this, this patient's neurodegeneration have a um, CRS component to it? Um, Asia syndrome, I missed. MCAS and then chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and my, uh, myalgia, and cephalomyelitis. I kind of think that we're all looking at these different entities from di a different angle. It's kind of like the elephant, the proverbial elephant. You know, if you're an immunologist, if you're um, Dr. Hugh Schoenfeld at the University of Tel, Tel Aviv, you call it Asia syndrome. If you're um, Dr. Afrin, you might call it MCAS. Um, I kind of use these tidbits to help me treat these patients because ultimately, to individualize their care, you have to have a bigger view than just CRS. We, we forget that these syndromes are defined mainly for research purposes. So we can define something, then research it and to get outcomes. And so um, typically that's the way research works. As you go through things, you actually realize the disease itself is actually bigger than our quote unquote syndromic diagnostic criteria. So the biotoxin pathway, um, you know, this I'd recommend people printing it out. If you go back and go through slides again, take this, look at it. one of the ways I learned this initially was just to going through and talking about leptin and MSH, it's right there in the middle and seeing where the hypothalamus sits into this. Actually understanding how these, these labs interdigitate with the actual pathology with this dysregulation. You know, one of the things with CRS, it's the regulation of regulation of regulation becomes dysregulated. And we start to see the layering of it. So I, I just really think this is useful. Um, so, you know, maybe refer back to this, maybe as I walk through it and you kind of look at this, flip through, but this is, has really helped me really kind of conceptualize what I'm doing when I, when I treat patients. So the very first thing is the HLA-DRDQ. Now this is actually the genetic predisposition that makes people have an increased risk for actually developing uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. It's actually on the CD4 
it's, it's an MHC2 complex, you know, so you got HLA, D, DP, DQ, DR. Well, we're looking at specific genes, specific haplotypes within that. And um, what happens is if you don't have the right ones, you actually, it affects the innate to acquired transition your immune system. So what happens is you're supposed to make antibodies, you know, a TH2 response to um, an infectious organism or a toxin is actually extracellular. And what happens with people who have the haplotypes, you know, they actually don't make antibodies to bind the toxins. So they have a poor detoxification and poor immunologic detoxification of um, the, the, the toxins in a water damaged building. Um, so um, it's located on chromosome six. Um, it's, a, you know, I already mentioned it's part of the innate immune system detoxification. But I think the thing that's interesting is 24% of the population has this gene, this allele. And we talked with Dr. Raff and he thinks about 23 to 25% of the population has MCAS. Um, Dr. Schoenfield thinks, you know, maybe a core of the population has Asia syndrome. Um, you know, how many people have um, chronic fatigue and fiber? We start seeing like, well, when you talk about these percentage of these, these genes and you start talking about other similar autoinflammatory syndromes that are these rare commonalities, we say they're rare because we don't know what we're looking for, but they're actually quite common. We realize there's a lot of interdigitation. These are the genes associated with, um, um, with increased risk for chronic inflammatory response syndrome. What I tell people is genes are not determinative. I actually am an 11.352B and a 15.651. Um, and I have all my markers are normal. Um, um, I have positive Marcons and I'm, I feel fine. You know, these genes are not determinative, but they are a risk. Um, another thing I tell, you know, what I'll talk about in the next slide is that the genes increase your risk for CRS, but they're not, you don't have to have the genes to get it. About 5% of people with CRS or 1 in 20 won't actually have this gene. And the Rosetta Stone is kind of how you take the, the data from LabCorp, which right now I think they're the only place doing this lab. Um, if someone out there knows better, they can correct me on that. Um, and so you have to kind of go through the Rosetta Stone to get the haplotypes and compare um, to what is going on. So um, that's the first, the first lab for diagnosis. The second is your MSH. Now, <clears throat> MSH is a really important neuropeptide. Um, it has multiple functions. It actually helps control pain perception via the endorphin system. You know, MSH is part of the POMC molecule. And when you make, you know, pro melanin cortin, you get corticotropin, you get you know, all these other things. MSH is a part of that. So that's kind of part of the intersection with how MSH dysregulation plays in the cortisone, cortisol and plays in the melatonin. Um, it also helps control white blood cell reads of cytokines. So that actually helps with inflammation. Um, and one of the interesting things about MSH it improves mucous membrane defense. Low MSH sets up for leaky gut. It also sets up for biofilm, low-grade biofilm infestations like the Marcons in your sinus, for example. So um, it also affects your, your neuropeptides, ACTH and ADH. So this is like one of the very, very important markers that it's hard to get people better until you get this um, normalized. Um, already mentioned kind of how it's produced. And MSH is made in response to leptin. One of the things we'll see when we go to other labs is that, um, is that CRS, you actually see leptin resistance. So people's leptin levels go up. You'll see issues with um, you know, hard to lose obesity. Like people get gain weight and they can't get the weight off because of this leptin, this lep leptin resistance induced um, adipocyte dysfunction. So MSH is actually an important key regulator in this. Um, so just a little side, and I'm, I put these little in the box because I put little tidbits on interpretation as you do the labs. You know, if your MSH is normal, your army for your house can be, you know, can be um, less than two, one or two. And if your MSH is low and your C4A is over 20,000, you actually need your army really, really low. Now, these criteria are changing with this, um, but this is like the basic kind of understanding um, from the um, um, training and coursework and the fellowship for this. So. Um, and the sources for MSH, it's um, melanocytes and the skin make it, as well as the arcuate nucleus, uh, nucleus, your anterior pituitary, and your hypothalamus. So this is actually made in multiple places um, in your body. It'll be low in 95% of CRS patients, which means 5% of people with CRS will have a normal MSH. Um, so low levels are associated with fatigue, pain, hormone abnormalities, mood swings, and again, biofilms, which I kind of already mentioned that. So we can see, you know, Alpha MSH is a really, really important lab to not only check and follow in this um, phenomenon. Now, C4A, there's, there's multiple different um, markers in the complement system. You know, C3A is a lab test I actually do frequently with these patients, but in the criteria, C4A is the one um, that's kind of made itself into the criteria. And one of the things when you look at this, you'll see, you know, C3 and C4 levels have been used to diagnose lupus. Well, you know, if those levels are low, you have an increased risk for lupus. And you can see, you know, with the classical pathway, the lectin pathway, 
how you know someone who has you know membrane exposures with bacteria is going to probably be more likely to activate and get elevated C three eight three eight levels versus the the classical pathways activated. Um, it tends to go more down to the um, C four A. Um, this is just more of a diagram schematic to help us wrap our brains around um, C four A a little bit. But elevation represents excessive innate immune response. So high levels can be seen in lupus and Lyme disease. You know, I already kind of mentioned this. You know, if your C3A level is elevated, that is suggestive of um, bacterial membrane exposure um, with the, the manosporin lectins activating that alternative pathway. And then you're getting elevated C3A and it's C4A levels as well. And getting this complement pathway activated, getting the MAC complexes activated. Um, it's a key marker for your innate immune system and CRS, WBB, and it reflects PAMPs, pathogen associated molecular patterns. Um, these are viruses, but they're also heavy metals. Um, as well as mycotoxins. And, you know, one of the things, you know, we'll talk about later is, you know, the biggest thing, you know, and 80% of CRS is water damage building. So we've mentioned um, Fisteria, Sagratera, et cetera. But within the world of, you know, water damage building, 80% of it actually is not mycotoxins. It's actinomyces and endotoxins. Well, endotoxins are basically lipopolysaccharide, sauerkraut around, you know, gram negative bacteria. And actinomyces is actually a soil based organism. And so these things, these pathogen associated molecular patterns, these, these very basic organisms can activate your innate immune system. Um, and cell wall components of fungi as well can activate um, C4A. <clears throat> Symptoms associated with high C4A, you know, restrictive lung disease, hypersensitive pneumonitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. You know, if you have a patient with chronic fatigue, you're like, well, they don't live in a moldy building. You know, a lot of chronic fatigue is actually CRS. It's just the patient's presenting differently. Um, any multi-system, multi-symptom disease, um, cognitive defects can be associated with, with um, elevated C4A levels. And physiologically, you see activation of mast cells and basophils. Okay, maybe this is the interplay with you know, MCAS I mentioned before. Um, you get increased formation of antigen antibody complexes, um, increased lectins. Um, you get binding to carbohydrates. That's one of the things that these molecules do is they bind carbohydrates either in um, glycosamine or glycans, cell membranes, et cetera. This innate pathway is kind of pre-programmed to bind things to make these, these um, MHC complexes to then play off, throw off into antigen presentation, activate your acquired immune, adaptive immune system, and eventually make antibodies. And that's where you, know, you get a, a loss of that, that transition happening. People get stuck in this innate immune system activation um, and then uh, increased smooth muscle contraction. So this, is, this can be helpful. This, this, I put this together. This is based on the Shoemaker data. They have, I think, probably now about over eight or 9,000 patients in their um, database. And this is largely based on his research and his research group looking at, you know, these are the numbers the pa patients have based on their symptoms. And so, you know, if you see over 20,000, I kind of assume um, there's mold until see otherwise, realizing that water damage building, you know, the, the most, the biggest offender actually are the um, actinomyces and neurotoxins <clears throat> or the, another way to say is the microbial volatile organic compounds. Um, you can see in chronic Lyme, you know, if someone's got, you know, post Lyme, so to speak, you have an 8,872 level. The re-exposure, you can see this thing pop back up really, really quickly. You know, there's this, this re-exposure phenomenon where the C4A can be coming down, someone gets a hit and it just skyrockets back right back up this, um, um, very, very quickly. So normal lab is 2830. Um, with a lot of these, I'll mention this really quick. With these labs, we look at like a lab core or other labs, normal ranges, and they'll be like, you know, four, five, 6,000, whatever. The normal ranges that I'm talking about, these are not for the general population. It's kind of like saying what's the normal vitamin D level in the general population. It's 30 to 100. Well, we all know those, that's not the optimal range. That's the way a lot of these labs work as well. You might see the normal range, but based on the Shoemaker group um, with Dr. Heyman's research at George Washington, that's where these numbers come from. So um, okay, the next, next marker is um, matrix metalloproteinase 9. Um, this enzyme is involved in the breakdown of extracellular matrix in normal cells. So we know there's an inflammatory process connective tissue um, needs to be broken down enzymatically. MMP9 is an is a important part of this whole process. Um, as far as physiologically speaking, it's, it helps with tissue remodeling, um, either in damage or um, an immunologic response. Um, disease processes that, uh, that are inflammatory, pro-inflammatory will have MMP9 be activated. And it, it's actually a way to help deliver inflammatory elements across the sub matrix. So I kind of remember, um, those of you who have heard Dr. Dr. Mark Houston's lectures in cardiology, and you have the pilling, the rolling, and you know, the leukocyte trans, transmigration. You know, those tight junctions to loosen 
and that white cell to, to go across and then it gets involved in the submental levels, that's kind of where MMP9 kind of pops in to this. Um, you know, the MMP9 currently is probably one of the more reliable ways to measure a TH1 immune response. And that's kind of way I kind of think about when I see um, um, the, the, the MMP9 lab being abnormal. If your TH1 is low, then the innate immune system will be affected. So that's, that's an important caveat. We'll see elevated um, MSH, I mean, sorry, MMP9 levels in COPD, rheumatoid arthritis, cardiomyopathy, and abdominal aortic aneurysms. So I just want to stop there real quick and just notice a couple of things. You know, aneurysms, cardiomyopathy, atherosclerosis, there's connective tissue, interstitial involved. Okay, and the reason interstitial and connective tissue, collagen is important is when we get to some of the last slides and talk about hypermobility and how that increases your risk for innate system inflammation, it makes sense how some of these innate activations are actually involving connective tissue mediators. Um, <clears throat> so ways to down, down, down regulate the MP9, Boswellia omega-3s, you know, so, so, um, SPMs, um, the, the best food source naturally for that is actually um, fish eggs, um, endless free diet, that, that's the push that the mold clap slash endless free diet, that's one of the ways you actually start abating some of this inflammation by removing certain kinds of carbohydrates that can actually act, um, act on some of the innate inflammation. Actos used to be used a lot. Well, I said used to be used, but it's not really used a whole lot anymore. And this is the normal range for the NMP9, 85 to um, 332 nanograms per, um, per ml. So ADH, so now we're getting to neck, now we're getting into neuroregulation, neurodysregulation, you know, how the HP body access with osmolality is being dysregulated. Um, the purpose of this slide is just to kind of wrap our brains a little bit around the, co the correlation with ADH and osmolality. If your osmolality is low, your body doesn't want to get more free water across, which is what ADH does, so your ADH is low. If your osmolality is high, you want your ADH to be elevated, so you get more free water um, across that distal con con um, DCT, so you can actually bring down your, your osmolality. So, so in a regulatory state, if osmolality is up, ADH should be up, osmolality is down, ADH should be down, but ideally it's in that middle range. Just kind of keep this in mind when we look at interpretation of the relative degrees of dysregulation. So um, the ADH is released from the posterior pituitary. Um, I already mentioned how it controls the quantity of free water the kidneys excrete. Um, low levels of, um, of um, ADH can result in decreased absorption of free water and increased osmolality, which we already kind of talked about that. And levels can be up depending on the stage of CRS, okay? Symptoms you see are dehydration. You know, the patient who says, I drink water and goes right through me. I drank a pee and I drank a pee. They might drink lots of water, but they're actually dehydrated. Frequent urination. One of the bizarre symptoms that are, are the shocks, the frequent static shocks in the cluster analysis. You know, why do patients have frequent shocks in the wintertime? Well, because they're basically losing water and they actually, almost like in cystic fibrosis patients, will get higher um, sodium chloride on the skin. And so they actually um, have better conduction of stack charges on their skin. It's kind of interesting. You do a urine on them and you'll see a low spec, um, spec grab, even if they haven't drank any water recently because it's going right through. We already mentioned the excessive thirst, electrical shots, and edema. It's this really weird phenomenon where they drink water, they get third spacing, even in the light of um, a low osmolality. And then you can have really crazy um, weight gain with based on the fluid imbalances. So, so the ranges, so you have normal ranges of ADH, absolute high and absolute low. Now, this is, this is important when you look at the labs. So if someone's ADH is absolutely high, it's over 13, that counts as a positive, like this of the lab, this one's positive, or the osmolality is absolutely high. So degree, same thing for the ADH, if it's absolutely low, less than 0 0.55 or the osmolality. But a lot of patients you'll see don't have an absolute, it's a relative. So your ADH is kind of sort of low when the osmolality is kind of sort of high a little bit, um, or your ADH is, you know, up a smidge and not quite a whole bunch. It's in the normal range, the nosmolality is a little low. So, we, so with the relative low, you have to have meet both criteria. With the relative high, you have to meet both criteria or either one of those. So this counts as one point um, in the, the three points for making your diagnosis. Again, adults um, need three of six in the labs to be positive. Um, ACTH and cortisone, this is the next neuroregulatory peptide that's a part of the main criteria. Um, this picture I'm just showing just for the image. Um, one thing to keep in mind is how the, now this picture shows the circadian rhythm, but the circadian rhythm actually originates in your hippocampus. Um, the whole limbic system, limbic kindling, amygdala, hippocampus, going into your midbrain structures. Um, 
that regulates your circadian rhythms um, and also um, helps with memory, right? That's so it's interesting. Some of the symptoms patients have sleep disturbances, you know, their daytime intrudes into the nighttime, um, sleeping problems, um, memory issues. Some of the symptoms patients will have are actually related with the issues in their brain, with the, the actual organic issues in the brain. So it's just kind of um, interesting. So um, yeah, I mean, don't forget, you know, this is the ACTH cortisol is under the control of the hippocampus. So some of the symptoms can be hippocampal symptoms. Um, so what are some of the implications of this intercorrelation with ACTH cortisol? And I mentioned the POMC mo molecule earlier, um, before. Well, MSH tends to fall early in the disease. So if someone's getting sick, their MSH will start to come down. But what happens is their body has a compensatory elevation in their ACTH and cortisol. And the result of your body having this compensation is they have very few symptoms while they're kind of going down this CRS pathway. Um, now, one, one thing I'm note, you know, if you have you know, both ACTH and cortisol elevated, you might want to look for neuroendocrine tumors. Um, you know, how common are they? I've, I've seen two in my career. So not super common, but they do exist. And again, you want to rule out all of the things. We kind of talked about that already. And as the disease progresses, you'll then start to see the ACTH fall and the cortisol fall. So um, wrong moves, you know, calling this adrenal fatigue. I've seen so many patients come to me in my clinic who came on hydroxy, um, home, hydrocortisone, for their chronic fatigue fiber, for their dysautonomia, for their POTS, for their, you know, their, their adrenal fatigue. And it's not the adrenals aren't fatigued, it's their brain. It's the hypothalamus speaking, setting the rhythm up to the um, hypothalamus pituitary and then to the adrenal glands. So that's, that's, that's one of the things, ways where we can actually hurt our patients where we don't realize what's going on and we start to treat the symptoms with hydrocortisone and not actually treat the underlying cause. Um, so again, you know, adrenal fatigue, it's actually HPA axis dysregulation is a better term for, for this. So with the diagnosis with ACTH and cortisol, you have your normal ranges there and they, that does change throughout the day. Same thing with the other neuroregulatory peptides. You have an absolute high and an absolute low. So the absolute low for ACTH being high or cortisol being high, absolute low for the ACTH or cortisol. The difference between ACTH and cortisol is that, um, if your cortisol is low, your ACTH should be high, right? Because your your the CRH is coming down. You need from the hypothalamus pituitary CRH. Then we go on um, ACTH, and then we get um, our um, cortisol down, um, downstream. Well, you can have this relative dysregulation where the ACTH is kind of low and the cortisol is kind of low, or when the ACTH is kind of high and the cortisol is kind of high. Again, for relative criteria, you have to get both. You have to have both the ACTH and the cortisol being dysregulated, either being elevated or low um, to get the point for this. Um, as far as the absolute, you just need one, either an absolute ACTH or an absolute cortisol elevation. So those are, you know, there's a lot of cool labs for CRS and we're gonna start diving into those. But as far as making the diagnosis, you know, exposure, you know, cluster analysis, um, get, you, get your VCS, which we'll talk about here and the basic labs. And that's kind of, that's like the bit, that's it. Now, if you want to dive deeper and understand the actual about the pathology, and what's going on with the patients, that's the next level. So Marcons, you know, what are, what are multiple antibiotic resistant coagulase native staphylococcus? These are a multi-drug resistant um, staph that um, lives in biofilms. So um, it can live in biofilms, urinaries. Um, there's actually interesting data with these being in biofilms and um, um, infected teeth and root canals and a whole host of places. Um, but what the, what, the, what the Marcons does, it releases hemolysins. And the hemolysins will cleave your MSH, and over time, the MSH will come down. So if someone has a low MSH, they have other, other labs that are off, and you don't actually test and treat the Marcons, you won't get them better. I've had patients who just starting treating this, they notice significant improvement in their symptoms by just um, treating the Marcons. Um, and then, yes, you must get the Marcons cleared to get the MSH to come up. Um, Visual contrast sensitivity test. This is a really cool test that actually helps measure the amount of blood flow to the back of your, your retina. So it's been used by the United States Air Force for over 40 years. Um, and it was actually used to see if people on the flight line were getting exposed to too much jet fuel, which is a, you know, it's a natural quote unquote, a petroleum based um, toxin, right? Well, it's interesting how the VCS can change with not just, you know, biotoxins, but other chemicals, et cetera. But it's a great, it's the, probably the best marker for a biotoxin-induced cytokine storm or illness um, after four, day, four days after exposure. So I'll use this in patients where they're getting better, they're feeling great, and all of a sudden they're kind of like, I'm feeling cruddy, I went to a friend's house, 
but I love that friend. Well, let's get you better. After you go visit them, check, check the VCS on day four. And if you're, if, if the VCS, if you're failing it, you were passing, you're failing it, it you got exposure at the house. So this is a really cool test that you can actually, after the person's passed it, use it for figuring out if they've got further exposures. Um, and it, again, we mentioned that it does re represent the effects of biotoxins um, to the vascular flow in the area of the retina, affecting their um, visual contrast. And what that basically is, it's your, your eye's ability to see lines that parallel lines that are separated, how close can they be before you, they look like one line to you? And the more blood flow to the back of your retina, the better you can see that. It's almost kind of like color vision in sunrise and sunset, everything's black and white, you need more light to actually see colors and, and demark them. Um, similar to that, except it's related to the blood flow um, to the capillaries in the back of your retina. And as you get less of that flow, you lose the ability to, to see these, these fine, very close um, lines. Leptin, we've already mentioned leptin before. This is the most important apocyte related hormone that activates MSH um, production in the hypothalamus. Um, the receptor actually gets damaged um, by toxin induced cytokine changes, like in um, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And you actually get leptin resistance. And so the patient's leptin starts going up. Um, you know, if you, if you, any, any of you out there have like weight loss clinics or do weight patients with, you know, resistant weight loss, you check a leptin level, it's high. Basically, the apocytes are dysfunctional. They're creating lots of adipokinins or you know, fat-related cytokines, and they are dysregulatory. And you can have these patients eat six leaves and twigs, I said, you know, 1,200 calories, 10, you know, 1,000 calories, and they still gain weight because of the dysregulation and their adipocytes' ability to release um, energy. And so you can have people have rapid weight gain. They can't explain it. And it's not fluid weight gain, which the um, ADH and the osmolality can't explain, but it's actually... Um, related to their um, obesity. Um, you can also see elevation of your TNF alpha, IL-1 and 6. Um, and this is where, as you get this leptin resistance, if you look back at the chart, you'll see how that plays into the leptin receptors in your brain and how they affect um, MSH levels. And so MSH um, usually um, downregulates some of these inflammatory markers. Um, as you get leptin resistance, you will get a diminution of MSH release. So specific antibodies. So now we talked about your innate immune system and how your body creates antibodies with the goal of binding um, the toxins, whatever you're exposed to. And then those antibodies will help them help you get the, get, the, get the toxins out of your body, primarily through excretion in the bile. And that's kind of where cholestyramine and binders come into play. Part of this dysfunction is this epiphenomena of producing antibodies. So the patient doesn't develop lupus, but they may have a positive ANA. They don't develop Hashimoto's, um, but they have a positive you know, thyroid antibodies and you know, positive actin. You know, in the literature, we see a more direct association with positive anti-cardiolipin antibodies um, and then um, anti-gliadin antibody. But this is an example of this dysfunction of your innate immune system spilling over into your adaptive immune system and you're making antibodies not against toxins, but against your own tissues. So the first one's anti-gliadin antibody. This is actually a marker for leaky gut and increased risk for autoimmunity. Um, when your MSH gets um, low, you actually get increased leaky gut. When MSH is low, you also have leaky brain. If you have leaky brain, you have leaky gut. You know, have you ever seen a patient get a concussion and they get diarrhea? And that's your know, leaky brain inducing leaky gut. You know, or someone gets an overexertion, you're running a marathon, you get diarrhea. That's exertion induced um, loss of the um, tight junks in your GI tract getting diarrhea. You know, and you can actually have one. Well, I have a couple of patients with exercise induced. Their CRS was from overtraining. That's much, much less common. Didn't really talk about that, but you can't actually see that because they're inducing leaky gut, toxins, and the immune system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, within 30 minutes of consuming um, gliadin, you'll get an inflammatory response and it can actually mimic ADHD in some patients, um, more in kids. And one of the reasons why the anti-gliadin is not part of the CRS criteria is that 58% of you know, 50 kids, for example, 58% of kids will have these, but that means that 42% don't. So it's, a, it's an interesting marker to track if they're positive, than with when you're doing their anti-mold slash, you know, um, 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 diet. Um, you also got to make sure that they're removing um, bread as far as that as well. And that becomes very, very important. Of course, any mold, anti-mold diet, et cetera, is going to not have gluten in there, but um, it tends to be one of the things people t like to cheat with. And these patients, it just can't be something they um, cheat with. Anti-cardiolipin antibody. Um, the highest concentration of cardiolipin antibodies on the inner membrane leaflet or mitochondria. And this is really interesting how CRS now is affecting mitochondrial energetics. The um, 
that inner mitochondrial lift, leaflet is made primarily of omega-6s, and omega-6s are the precursors for cardiolipin. And this is where some of Dr. Um, Heyman's research and work using um, balanced omega-3s, omega-6s, um, using PC, things like that to actually flush out the toxins that get stuck here and cause dysregulation in the inner mitochondrial leaflet. Um, the anti-cardiolipin antibody represents an unfolding of this inner membrane and it actually exposes itself to your immune system. So in order to make an anti-cardiolipin antibody, it literally is this unfolding of the membrane, if you can kind of visualize it, it flips inside out and now it's exposed to your immune system and your body starts making antibodies to your own, literally to your own mitochondria. Um, you also get uncoupling of the electron transport chain, which again sits in, the, in these mitochondrial membranes and that can affect um, energy metabolism, a whole host of things, you know, um, this is what I call, this is membrane medicine at its finest, using lipids, mega, balanced omega-6s, omega-3s, PC, and other lipid medicine things to treat these patients. And that's what some of the stuff that um, Dr. Heyman's been doing in his research in the CRS community. Um, you know, 33% of kids with CRS will have these antibodies and 8% of the normal population will have this. This is a pretty profound thing to think about. You know, 20% of Americans have some kind of positive autoantibody. Um, this phenomena they were talking about it with this unique um, population is actually pretty common. And other lab tests. So TGF beta one, you know, I do this in all my patients, even though it's not, I didn't mention the first part and second part. This is a great marker for someone's immune system being overactive. And I'll talk about it a little later on, but elevated TGF beta one is associated with remodeling and interstitial tissues and fibrosing disease. If you have a patient with pulmonary fibrosis with, with lung scarring, um, who scars unusually, um, adhesions, you know, intra-abdominally, um, kidney scarring, you, you got to think, what's the inflammatory process? And TGF beta-1 is actually a part of that process. I have one of my patients who actually was on um, transplant list at UVA for um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and he's now off of it because his lung function on this sponsor got, his FEV1 got over 30%, and they're like, well, you're doing great. Um, after realized, you know, his water-damaged house was part of the reason why, the reason why he had pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so it's a potent immune suppressor. Um, it has a role in promoting tolerance to allergens and self. So that's important, tolerance to allergens and tolerance to yourself. Um, it promotes remodeling, which we talked about already. Um, here's where it's interesting. The natural tendency to be increased with those with fibrillin one mutation. What does that mean? Think hypermobility. If your patient has a positive Baten score, if their arms are long and they are tall, which by itself increases your risk for CRS, um, those patients, because of their hypermobility, which actually is, you know, an athletic ben benefit, you can reach a little higher if you're a volleyball player, if you're Michael Phelps, you can, you know, you ever see the picture of him dislocating his shoulder, you know, it has an athletic advantage, but in these patients, the hypermobility increases the risk for tissue inflammation. And this is kind of where that, that, that sits. Um, normal is less than 2380. You start to have symptoms with if the TGF beta one's over 5,000. And you start to see restrictive lung disease, joint issues, cognitive problems, and a tremor uh, when the patient has over a 10,000 level. So it's kind of those things when you're doing your physical exam and you're looking for tremor, the patient extends their hand, spreads their fingers, and you're looking for that fine, fine CRS tremor. You know, when you see a profound one, the question is correlate it with your labs, you know? Um, anyway, uh, this is the best surrogate marker for TH17 function. You know, we've got your TH1, your CD4 positive T helper cells, TH1, TH2, TH17, TH3, and Tregs. This is the marker, the TGF beta one, to look at the TH17 function. Um, elevation over time can elevate the IL-10, which can also lead to autoimmunity. And if the levels are elevated in the absence of the ROR receptor, the Tregs, which I just minute, mentioned, can be transformed to pathogenic T cells. And so now this feed forward dysregulation, and we get dysregulation of dysregulation of dysregulation. Now, our body has this really unique system where you're supposed to regulate your regulation of your regulation. Well, in this disease, we get dysregulation of our dysregulation of our regulation. So that's the reason why you have to have this very nice 13-step pathway to, to treat these patients. VIP, which I'm mentioning at the end, um, this is, there's actually a treatment for this. This is like at the very top of the biotoxin pathway when treating patients. This is like the creme de la creme thing to treat patients. Like, and some people have a really profound impact on the dysautonomia, their POTS, their pain. It can help reset their entire neurohormonal axis. Um, but this is a neuroregulatory peptide that helps regulate peripheral cytokine receptors and a peripheral inflammatory response. So it's a central related release thing, which also, by the way, VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, also released in the gut. 
affects peripheral inflammation. Um, it also affects pulmonary artery pressure and blood flow. Um, you know, a lot of the patients with CRS have shortness of breath due to the decreased blood flow to the lungs and increased right side heart pressures. You know, that, this is where VIP kind of starts playing with some of these things. Um, low levels are associated with hypoperfusion of the capillaries and elevated here, elevated pulmonary artery pressure. Um, it also downregulates MMP9, it regulates VEGF, <clears throat> it helps restore balance of vitamin D, it helps normalize aromatase, and we'll talk about estrogen and testosterone in some of the labs here in a second. It helps lower C4A and TGF beta 1. One thing interesting, restores balance of vitamin D. And I was actually reading an interesting article uh, two weeks ago looking at the issue with low vitamin D, and the article actually was really interesting and said, actually low vitamin D levels probably not related to skin color, probably not related to sun exposure, it's related to infections and inflammation. You know, and I think it's really interesting because I see patients with diabetes, periodontal disease. I can't really explain why their D's are so low, but they have a chronic infection in the mouth. Um, you know, and the other thing about vitamin D that's important is vitamin, and, you know, this is kind of going to some um, long COVID stuff, right? You, know, you get exposure and there's this handoff of your innate going to your adaptive immune system. Well, that, that exposure, if you, you get exposed to XYZ, you get antigen presentation, the T cells come across, you get your B cells, you make antibodies that handoff requires robust levels of vitamin D. Maybe this is, maybe this is where low vitamin D deficient, low vitamin D levels affects patients with um, COVID and makes the virus hang around longer or sets them up for this longer inflammatory process. Um, VIP helps restore the, the balance of vitamin D that, that inflammation can negatively impact. Um, C3, you know, C3A, you know, look at the, the, the little chart above I kind of have there. This is, this is anaphylaxitoxin. It's um, chemotactic free eosinophils. It causes um, smooth muscles constriction. It's really important with the amplification loop and the, and the complement cascade. And this, um, this amplification gives you large amounts of C3A. Um, the one interesting thing about C3A, if you look at the chart, and it's the, not, the, the, um, not the classic, but the alternate and the manospine um, protein um, lectin there, you know, that's related to bacterial membranes. If you see a high C3A, one of the things I wonder is, are there exposed bacterial membranes that the patient's being exposed to that can actually drive this aspect of their complement um, system? Lyme, maybe. Um, you can see an elevation in patients with lupus, um, but the actual diagnostic for lupus would be C3 and C4, not the C3A. But you know, if the patient, you think they have lupus, you might want to throw in a C3 and C4 um, just to see. Um, and there's a significant overlap with Lyme, you know, post-Lyme syndrome and CRS where damage building. You know, the, the patients I've seen have come to me from other clinics who had chronic Lyme. Um, I've only gotten them better after I dealt with their CRS. I've seen patients actually go from clinics, they were on AMOX for a year, come to me, found out they're hypermobile, they had SIBO, they had some mast cell issues. Oh, by the way, your house has mold in it and um, have their Lyme bands normalized after I dealt with this and didn't give them more antibiotics because they already had a year of antibiotics that didn't, didn't work. So um, lots of overlap with these entities. And other labs. So, you know, looking for clotting and CRS. Part of this disease is actually a dysregulation in the, in the endothelium. Okay, we should, with COVID, we, we should know endothelium, well, von Willebrand actually is, is a procoagulant that actually sits in the endothelium. And that's kind of where the clotting phenomena um, in, in, um, in COVID sits. You know, the D dimer, um, fibrinogen, these are, these are two labs, the D dimer fibrinogen, that actually the um, British Medical Journal, they actually have a protocol for primary care managing the long COVID. And they recommend those labs to test for, does this patient have this low grade inflammatory process that has coagulation effects? You know, it's interesting how, you know, one of my questions is, you know, is you know, long COVID gonna be our next, is the next new CRS phenomenon? Will we add in to this, you know, mold, Lyme, all these things I mentioned, we're gonna be thinking about COVID because some of these markers, um, in my, I have a lot of long COVID patients and um, to date, I'm seeing hypermobility, I'm seeing mold um, as a big, big part of a lot of their long COVID. So if you're seeing long COVID patients, use this information, you know, think, reach out, you know, um, um, use this information to help you take care of them. Fibrinogens, procoagulant, um, anticarlipid antibodies, procoagulant, we all know about the um, um, anticarlipid antibody syndrome. Um, and the acquired von Willebrand um, factor syndromes can be associated with clotting or bleeding. You know, you also will see an increased C4A levels associated with these clotting phenomena. And I already mentioned how, um, I didn't mention though, but SARS-CoV-2 does, does one of the things it does affect the ACE, the, um, ACE2 receptor on the endothelium you know, in your lungs um, and your arteries and your GI tract, you know? Um, so that's kind of interesting. And we're gonna be seeing 10% you know, of patients who get COVID are gonna get long COVID. 
you know, use this information here. You start seeing those patients to say, wait a second, is this, did you have something else going on? Do you now have CRS, check those labs? And, and to date, about 34% of my patients actually have met CRS criteria. And um, almost a third of them have been hypermobile. So D-dimer is a marker for clots, breakdown, um, it's elevated in many other diseases, including the aging process. Um, you'll see it elevated post-COVID um, and um, it will um, rise in, a, in acquired von Willebrand's disease. And then the plasminogen activated inhibitor. This is a big, big, big um, lab in the research. Um, it's not using the, the formal criteria, but it's really super important. Um, it's the principal inhibitor, inhibitor for TPA and neurokinase. Um, and elevations associated with atherosclerosis, clotting, obesity, cancer, and metabolic syndrome. And additional labs. Um, okay, that's all right. So additional labs. Things to think about. You know, this is where just this is not formal CRS stuff. This is just you know me, Aaron Hartman, MD, and the team in Virginia, with Dr. Christian Jensky. Um, he's my partner. And we talk back and forth about stuff. And this is where we just two minds seeing patients thinking things through. You know, MCAS, the mast cell activation syndrome. You know, sounds a lot like CRS, you know, what maybe doing some MCAS labs on these patients as well. CRP, CMP, you know, the, the hormone dysregulation as, as aromatase levels get mixed up, you know, um, estradiol levels, you know, vitamin D is super huge. You know, if it's low, you know, I see a low vitamin D now, I, I'm looking for inflammation and infections. I'm not just saying, oh, you work inside, you know, um, how can I have normal vitamin D levels of 60 and I work inside as someone, you know, my brother, um, who you know doesn't eat the best and has some dental issues has a super low vitamin D. You know, the newest literature I've read as of two weeks ago is suggesting that might be from infections and inflammation. And then the super advanced testing, the NeuroQuant and the transcriptomics. I'm actually gonna put a shout out to everybody out there right now. If someone knows where they can get NeuroQuant done, um, let me know. I've been searching. I was doing a lot of it until about six months ago when the reader I was working with um, stopped licensing outside of state. I was actually sending out to the West Coast doing it local. And so I was doing tons of these to help delineate some of my um, PTSD versus um, Lyme versus mold patients. Very, very helpful. Um, but I've just had a hard time in central Virginia finding a place to get it done. So if anybody knows some place they're sending out their, their NeuroQuant, they're getting a the disc at their local person and they're seeing it somewhere that they're reading for them. Um, let me know because um, I've called um, Cortec Labs and um, basically I need to buy the, the software, which, you know, I'm not going to spend the $20,000 for it. And finally, transcriptomics. Um, this is a really interesting field that um, you know, the, the Shoemaker Group is really, really big on. Dr. Heyman's using this as well. Um, I'm close enough to both of them that we, I've actually had some of my patients go see them. I think it's really cool, but clinically for myself, you know, it's a big cost. And, you know, if your C4A, if your other C4 numbers are still off, your VIP is still low, I'm going to focus on, on those things. I know this is the wave of the future. I personally haven't really instituted quite yet in my practice. Um, and it's really hard to ship. Um, the dry house makes it a big issue, um, even more so than C3A and C4A levels. So, um, and with that, um, thanks for your attention. Um, I do, um, it was mentioned earlier, I do have a whole blog series on mold CRS type one, two, three, and four. I mean, part one, two, three, and four. Um, you can just scan this and go to the website. Um, I have a lot of resources there that I put for patients as well. So feel free to, um, to use those, use those for yourself. And, um, and hopefully this was helpful. Great, thank you, Dr. Hartman. Um, it looks like we do have a handful of questions. So we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, so we can kind of knock those out really quick. Um, let's see. So I know a couple of people, just really quick, a couple of people did ask about a recording. Yes, we always record the webinars. Those will be available in the portal generally two to three business days later. Um, and we also try to make the slides available if we can as well. Um, so that look for that in the portal. Um, we also usually send out an email with a link to it as well. Um, one person did ask, what was the name of the textbook that you mentioned? This was just at the beginning. Yep. That textbook, you actually, in order to get that, you actually get it when you sign up for the CRS part A through um, A4M. And it's actually what Dr. Heyman and Schumacher put together. So that's the only, and I, that's the only way I know to get it right now is actually by taking that course. So it's not, you can't buy it on Amazon anywhere. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, Artie asked, what would elevated levels of VIP and MSH mean? You know, you, dysregulation. So MSH is up, VIP is up. That's the, usually with CRS, it's usually down. You know, the question is what else is going on? You know, with, if you have someone, is, are they early on? Like, is their um, ACTH really high? Is their cortisol high? Because you have to see where the MSH is hooked up 
with that POMC molecule. So that's where doing the other labs would be helpful to kind of delineate what's going on. You look at that, the biotoxin pathway and see where things kind of fit in. So I'd be kind of curious if the message is high. Okay, that's interesting. Um, what's the melatonin level? You know, um, what's their ACTH? What's their cortisol? You know, is there, is there some neuroendocrine tumor or something else kind of going on with them? Great. Uh, let's see, there's a few questions from Catherine. She said, might these patients present with strange fascia problems? Uh, that's actually a question I've heard quite a few times from providers um, as far as like chronic inflammatory response. I mean, I mean, the thing about it is like, fascia is such a big, big deal on a lot of these patients. You know, do a bait and score on them. You know, go to the EDS Society, download that little form. It has how to do a bait and score, has the criteria one, two, then the rule out three, you know. If someone's hypermobile, one of the things with hyper, and this has like become like a mainstay for me now, I'm checking hypermobility in all these patients because what happens as these patients age that are hypermobile, they actually get tighter and stiffer. So it's this weird phenomenon. You're like 12 or 13 and you're super loosey goosey, you know, cool sports and you get to be 40 and now you're tight. So you have tightness. The people now, you know, they, they can't put their palms on the ground anymore and their fascia is actually tightened up as a protecting mechanism for the joints. They get osteoarthritis earlier in life because they have the loose joints, but now the fascia and tendons are tight. So if, when I hear that, I kind of, first thing is like, are you hypermobile? You know, and there's a whole host of things, um, cervical instability. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a small segment of these people that have cervical instability. And that's where you get some of the weird kind of neurological symptoms um, and some bizarre dysautonomias as well. You know. Um, so when I hear those things, I automatically think, you know, I think Pentad, and that's, you know, Dr. Afrin's term for the, the association of um, hypermobility, Ehlers-Danlos, um, um, and that MCAS, um, um, GI issues and autoimmunity, like looking for those things. And, you know, if one out of 30 Americans is hypermobile, which is the number right now, um, there's a lot of people out there that aren't being seen that have that as part of, um, potentially of um, part of their illness. And you also have to realize that the hypermobile, they tend to have more gut issues, more SIBO, um, more nutritional absorption issues, more inflammation. They need more D, they need more C, they need more trace minerals. So all of a sudden now, that small test is giving you a whole bunch of um, therapies you can use for those patients. Great, yeah, that's a great way to tie that all together. Um, let's see, would it be common to see strangely lab low C3 and C4 following treatment with steroids? Um, I think that's, that's an interesting question. I think it depends on, um, what was being treated with the steroids, you know, if they had some kind of infection, maybe that you're blocking, um, I have to think about that a little bit, cause I'd have to wonder what the, what their, what their, the patient's picture is and what's being, what the steroids treating, you know, yeah. um, because you have to realize if you're the complement system that was revved up or maybe it was normal and now it's been suppressed, what, um, what will suppress that then all of a sudden now the confidence system's just kind of hanging out. Um, she said the steroids uh, were for rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, it's okay. So, okay, that's a great rheumatoid arthritis, you know. Um, you know, every one of my patients I've seen to date with rheumatoid arthritis has significant dysbiosis issues. I'm, I'm not talking about the usual kind of thing. That's become like a critical, that, that and some psoriasis, those patients, like if I don't get their gut super squared away, um, I'm not gonna get in better regardless of all the other stuff. And so when I hear rheumatoid arthritis, I'm like, I'm thinking, okay, is there some kind of gut pathology? You know, those patients, do they have an elevated HSCRP? You know, um, um, it's interesting how many patients have elevated HSCRP actually have a low grade infection somewhere and doxycycline, not that I'm advocating that, can have a massive impact on lowering the HSCRP and affecting their inflammation. So, you know, if, if you got steroids and you saw that these things come down, in the rheumatoid patient, maybe you're suppressing part of their body's immune response to some underlying infection, whether SIBO dysbiosis or, you know, tick-borne Lyme, you know, who knows what else. Um, dental, you know, I've, I've seen a number of patients with rheumatoid who actually have um, dental cavitations and infected root canals um, or periodontal disease. So it's, it's a big, sure. you say infections, it's a big, big um, tent. Yeah. Uh, let's see, how does aromatase get affected? Is it high estrogen and low testosterone? It, yeah, exactly, it gets bumped up. And so um, the, um, you get revved up aromatase activity and you get testosterone goes down and then the um, um, estrogen goes up, exactly. Okay, and I actually have a question. Um, what is there, do you know, and this might be obscure, is there a connection between chronic inflammatory response 
um, any of the markers that you've listed and um, halogen abnormalities, especially fluoride, because this is a personal thing that I've gone through because I've been exposed to mold probably four or five times. And you, I, lost, I lost the first part of that. Would you mind repeating that again? Sorry. Um, like, is there a connection that you've seen with chronic inflammatory response um, and or mold, uh, specifically mold biotoxins and fluoride? Like a like the body becomes intolerant to fluoride or has weird reactions to it for you know, allergens. Well, think about fluoride. And you know, one of the things I, I briefly, I tried to do a lot in a short time. I briefly mentioned how the Th2 part of your immune system, the Th1 part of your immune system deals mainly with intracellular things mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, Lyme and other things like that. Hence the cytotoxic T cells. The Th2 part of your immune system, basophils, eosinophils, it's more extracellular things, but also toxins. Okay. okay. So that's part of the whole making antibodies to bind toxins. And you have to realize that a lot of these things are toxic. Just you know, yes, fluoride, you know, affects iodine, it's a halogen, it, you know, blood, but they're also toxins. You right. Know, that, and so is it actually, in, act, you're losing the ability for your body to clear that toxin. You know, you got to realize all these patients are toxic. You know, you know, why is it that I can have mm -hmm. markers and I'm fine? Cause my cup has not been filled up. Mm -hmm. I'm not at a triggering event. You know, once that happens, that's when your people start becoming super sensitive to everything. They even sensitive to supplements, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I would probably think of that more along the lines of toxicity, um, the need to focus on gut detoxification, sweating, um, mm -hmm. respiration, as well as um, urination. Okay. Um, all right. And I think there was one other question. Um, might these types of patients show reactive foods on a food sensitivity test? yet they know they react to foods. Absolutely. You do a food IgG panel on these people and everything lights up. You do an IgE and everything lights up. That's where that whole, you know, increased gastrointestinal permeability. So if you get, you know, the immunoglobin aspect that, and I also do immunoglobins on these people. I do Ig, G, IgM, IgA, and also stool IgA. You'd be surprised what you see um, with the Ig, the serum IgG um, immunoglobin levels, as well as with the, um, the stool, how they start these, they have these massive shifts. You know, their stool IgA shoots up and the serum's kind of down. Why? They're trying to wall off and protect themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you get this, you know, MSH mediated loss of bowel integrity, you can start reacting with, you know, all kinds of things. Okay, makes sense. Um, yeah, one, I'm sorry, to, the, the, these patients also, it's like you do the elimination, you, that's, let's remove these five foods, right? And they do great for a while. And then they have, now they're reacting to five more foods and move right. them. What happens is their diet gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller because now they're reacting with whatever, anything they eat. And so that's where, you know, get them on the right path initially, but you have to address um, the increased gastrointestinal permeability. Otherwise, they'll just keep on reacting with whatever the new diet thing is. Sure. That makes sense. All right. Well, it looks like that was all of the questions. Um, so Dr. Hartman, this was great. You went into such good detail. I'm sure that, you know, we'll all want to rewatch this probably a few times. Um, like I did mention before, we do always provide a recording. Usually that's up in the provider portal where you can log in um, generally within two to three business days. Uh, we also will send out an email with a link for anybody who's registered. So even if you happen to miss this or part of it, you can get that. Um, Dr. Hartman, thanks so much. It looks like you have your website up there for people to find you as well as like a little QR code if they want to find you online. Um, do you have any other social media or contact points or anything you want to throw out there just in case anybody wants to get a hold of you outside of any of those, like if they're on Facebook or Instagram or anything like that? I mean, I am like, you know, if you go to the website, all that, that leads to all the Instagram. I am on Instagram and Facebook and um did some, a little bit of YouTube, but mainly on Facebook, Facebook and Instagram are the main, are the main social media um, vehicles that I'm on right now. So you can find me there as well. Great. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank you so much on behalf of Vibrant. Dr. Hartman, thanks for your time tonight. This was so informative. Um, you know, this was, this was exactly what I think everybody kind of wanted was just sort of an overview of, of the markers here and to kind of further understand running these markers and panels and looking at labs, you know, what, what happens next or what should you be looking for? So um, again, thank you for your time tonight. Thanks for everybody that tuned in. Um, and we hope to see you again on the next webinar. Great. Thanks for having me. Really, really enjoyed it.